Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Pete. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Uh, grateful to be alive and sober and part of a sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, first things first, thank the group for uh, inviting me out here and putting me up this weekend. Uh, I'm grateful to be here to share my experience, strength, and hope with you. Um, it's not my first time out to Washington. Uh, I've been out here a few times. Uh, my fiance is from Bellingham, Washington, so she took me on a bit of a tour today. Uh, I visited a place called Snoqualmie Falls. Yeah. Um, for the first 20 minutes, I thought I was John Rambo in First Blood. Uh, but I'm from Florida, so I showed up with white linen pants and a white shirt, and they knew I was from Florida. I had no business being on a trail. Um, it, it was a sight. I mean, people were walking up and down, and <clears throat> they being very polite, but looking at me dressed in linen, walking up the streets. Uh, uh, I'm originally from New York, as you can tell, and I don't belong on trails. Um, <laughs> June 23rd, 1988 was my separation from alcohol, and I'm grateful to be as a recovered alcoholic. And I say recovered because I am, because anything less than that would be falsely humble. I'm not telling you I'm cured or don't need to be here anymore. But the first promise in the big book talks to us about getting recovered from a singly hopeless state of mind and body. And so hopefully at some point during this talk, you can be convinced that I'm bearing witness to something like that. That is by the mercy of God and the power of God I found in the sacred rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that has resurrected my life. June 23rd, 1988 was my separation from alcohol. And I'm grateful over the years that God has little by slowly closed the ears to my mind and little by slowly has opened up the ears to my heart to make me teachable, to keep me in a place of reasonableness, to listen to the elders in Alcoholics Anonymous, to have a sponsor who has a sponsor and be able to be on the service, working service, having lots of uh, youngins that I work with, men that I sponsor, and being in the center of Alcoholics Anonymous and thank the good Lord not out on the fringes. I'm very grateful for the message I found in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, that was really given to me by by a sponsor. I didn't come to alcoholism. I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous just to not drink. That's not my goal. But I come to Alcoholics Anonymous not only to not drink, but to recover from alcoholism because my alcoholism doesn't live in a bottle of whiskey. Because if it did, all I'd have to do is stop drinking and find some activity not to pick up a drink. But what I have found over the years is that when I'm not drinking, I'm in worse shape than when I'm drinking. Because my alcoholism kind of surfaces and I start to do things that are not very spiritual. When I'm drinking, I'm very predictable. What I do is I, I drink, I get drunk, I cry, and then I borrow money off you. That's what I do. <laughs> it's when I'm not drinking and I need money to get a drink that I start to do a lot of bad things. I start to lie, deceive, manipulate, etc. You can't leave anything around in front of me because I will steal it if it means that's the price of a drink. Because what I do as an alcoholic, if I'm untreated in Alcoholics Anonymous or if, God forbid, I'm out there, is I forget about the consequences of tomorrow for the comfort of right now. I really don't care. I just need what I need to do right now. And what I found in Alcoholics Anonymous, that that can exist while I'm sober. While I'm sober going to meetings, getting chips and getting coins, that my alcoholism is still running the show. That I'm seeing the world through fear. I'm hearing the world through fear. I'm speaking to the world through fear. My actions resemble someone who's living in fear and an untreated alcoholic. And I have found for me, and I speak for myself, going to meetings is part of the three legacies. I get to be here. I need to be here. But it's not going to treat my alcoholism. For years, I thought I was a nice guy who was just misunderstood and overserved. <laughs> what I come to find out is I'm, I'm, I'm not a nice guy. I'm really not. Left untreated, you don't really want to hang out with me because I become narcissistic, egocentric, prideful, selfish, self-centered, self-seeking, all those things. I lie when the truth will serve, and I do these kind of things. That's an alcoholic synonymous while I'm making meetings, untreated. 
But something happens to someone like me who gets treated in Alcoholics Anonymous via the 12 steps, which is a a pathway to God to experience oneness with God. Something changes in here where we became, we become fundamentally different, changing from the inside out, that the old person disappears and what emerges what God created originally. Something that's what the Oxford group talked about going back to purity, honesty, unselfishness and love, little by slowly. And I don't look like the guy who walked in here June 23rd, 1988. I used to think I had to come to Alcoholics Anonymous to do a whole bunch of good deeds, walk a really straight line, so that God would finally love me. And I've been taught in Alcoholics Anonymous, and my experience will abundantly confirm this, that God doesn't love me if I change. God loves us so that we can change. So I'm not talking about a God out there that I really don't know, but they have a direct relationship or oneness with this power called God. And that, to me, has been the thing that has transformed my life. In fact, I will tell you, this whole thing about Alcoholics Anonymous, I get to travel all over the globe doing this. I meet AAs all over. I've seen fellowships all over, our meetings all over. And there's one common thread that we need to get to and we talk a lot about, in my opinion, not enough, is that Alcoholics Anonymous is about experiencing the glory of God in the sacred rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Whatever our conception of God might be, great outdoors, group of drunks, good early direction, whatever it is, But the 12 steps, the fellowship, the service are all vehicles to take someone like me to experience oneness with this power called God. Because anything less than that great fact, I'm an untreated alcoholic and I'm no good to you or anyone else. And at some point, there's a drink waiting for me. But my alcohol is not going to announce its arrival. It's not going to say tomorrow we're coming and get you. It just shows up and we get hijacked. I get hijacked. Sitting at a meeting on Monday, I'm drunk on Tuesday. It doesn't announce its arrival, but it starts little by slowly. It starts with eroding the spiritual structure that was built by a little bit of dishonesty, a little bit of deceitfulness, not making a meeting, not calling a sponsor, and little by slowly start to get away from you. I'm so far away from you, the only thing left to do with me with all this stuff going on is to pick up a drink, and I don't see that coming. If I'm instilled, if I'm still in denial about my first drink, where it's going to take me to, then the things AA asked me to do seem to be difficult and troublesome and cumbersome. But when I'm no longer in denial about where the first drink is going to take me to the second drink, and then the third drink, and then the fifth drink is screaming louder than the first drink, then the things AA asked me to do are not so difficult. I'm willing to exchange old ideas that did not work for new ideas that will work, and you're you're living proof of that. So I'm grateful to be part of this fellowship, the sacred fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you haven't found out the sacredness of AA, I pray you stick around long enough to experience the sacredness of it, because you will see, like many of us have, people get reborn and resurrected right here. The guy with 30 days, in a few months from now, he's sponsoring someone. The woman who walks in one day in a couple of months, she's sponsoring someone. And they're right in the middle of this. And their outlook on life has changed. They're talking about this power called God. They have a prayer life. They have a life of inventory and meditation. And we have sponsors. Everything changes. A complete shift. I knew nothing about that in June of 1988, guys. My separation from alcohol came in the back of an abandoned building on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, an area we used to call Alphabet City. And back in the 80s, it was an awful place to be. There were people like me running around, basically. (laughs) There was a thing called Operation Pressure Point they had where if you were on the street and the cops did a sweep, even if you're coming home buying groceries, you got taken in. That's how bad it was. It was just a sordid spot, and that's where I used to run. And in, in, in uh, the summer of 88, I found an abandoned building to live in. I had been through six treatment centers, and I kept getting drunk. I've gone to Alcoholics Anonymous drunk, or I get drunk right afterwards. I could not stay sober. I had powerful desires not to do it again, and I'd get drunk. I made firm resolutions not to drink again, and I'd get drunk. I'm a Catholic. I would sit in front of a priest and say, I have a drinking problem. He would bless me and say, I'm not going to drink, so I'll hit the fresh air. I went right to the liquor store. I could not stop drinking. Money, no money, whatever it might be. Six treatment centers, I thought I was absolutely hopeless. My family had pretty much locked the doors on me. My family want nothing to do with me. There were no relationships. There was no employment. No one would hire me, nor could I keep a job. And I found an abandoned building 
And I liked abandoned buildings because the cops rarely ran through abandoned buildings unless it was a 911. So I would, I would took up residency in the back of this building and I would come out to panhandle money, hustle up money, get a drink and go back to the hallway again. That was my life. And I loved drinking and if I could get extra money to eat Valium and eat pills. And that's what I do. And the lower I can get, the better. The more numb I could get, the better. Because I could not deal with life. Life was problematic. It seemed to be unfair hurt. And I didn't have the GPS to do life. What I'm happy to tell you as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, without any kind of spiritual muscles, I still can't do life. I never try to do life on life's terms anymore because I need a double vodka to walk out the door to do life on life's terms. And more of anything is what I need. And being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, as sacred as it is, I need something to go out there, to go to work, to have a relationship, just to show up. I need something. I need a GPS. I need a spiritual airbag to do life. And I had nothing except a pint of whiskey. And so there I was in the back of this hallway, no family contact, no nothing. I would go to the liquor store, buy a pint, go back to the hallway and come out to hustle up money. And the trap doors have trap doors. I didn't see June 23rd coming. But every time I would get arrested, I would say, I'm never going to do this again. I'm going to stop. But then when you need a drink and the hands start shaking and the belly starts going funny and the cold sweats start, I'll get a drink and figure out how not to drink. And I was right back to the vicious cycle again. June 23rd, 1988, guys, I was laying in the back of this hallway. I was positioned behind these old metal radiators. I thought no one could see me if I leaned up against the wall and the radiator was there. Now, I hadn't changed my clothes in I don't know how long, nor did I take a shower and I don't know how long, or had a decent meal and I don't know how long. I weigh about 195 pounds right now. I was a good buck 30 back then, tops. I'm running around with hepatitis C and urinating blood. I'm falling apart. I'm literally dying of alcoholism. And this one particular morning, I got up and my life changed. I got up off the floor and my life changed. Now, the same way I can't see alcoholism coming down the block to scoop me up, I can't see God sometimes either and his merciful hand showing up. I couldn't see recovery about to be delivered to me. And when it did, it didn't feel that way. My thing is when I go to God and ask him a question, even currently, God, I have a question. I expect God to send me back a neatly wrapped gift box with a little red ribbon to Peter from God. Here's your answer. Sometimes the answer comes in an ugly, broken down, smelling drunk. Sometimes it comes in taking a detox commitment. Sometimes it just shows up when you pray. But sometimes the answer doesn't look like the answer. Especially when God's answer feels so painful. I thought God just sent me to trials of Job on June 23rd, 1988, because it felt so painful. And I'm in the back of this hallway. I'm dying of alcoholism, and I have this realization that I need to get a drink in me, but if I get a drink in me, I'm going to die, and I didn't want to die. But if I don't get a drink in me, I'm going to die, and I don't want to die. And I was at the jumping off place. What do you do? Back then, guys, if you were a man, And you came at me talking to me about spiritual things or religious things or some godly deity. I would think you would weak and cowardly. Men are not spiritual. Men are not religious. Men are like John Wayne. You just tough it out. Religion and God was for women and children. So if you came at me like that, that's how I felt. And when you mentioned the word God, I would more than bristle with antagonism. I don't want to hear about the word God. When I was 14 years old, my mom, who suffered from alcoholism and some psych issues, committed suicide after about a half a dozen attempts, and I grew up without a mom, and I had a lot of venom towards God, and if God was so loving, then why did he do this to my mom? If God was so loving, why am I living in the back of an abandoned building and I cannot get away from alcohol? For any little dope fiends out there, I have a long history of non-conference approved dry goods just to let you know that. But here I was, and I went to get up off the floor, because I needed to get a drink. You know, by the way, you know what's really frightening? The Alkies know exactly what I'm talking about. There comes a point where the lifestyle, uh, you hit the emotional bottom where you say, oh my God, my life is falling apart. It's because of the whiskey. This is really bad. I got to do something. But you get a drink and you kind of wash it away. Then you hit another, another plateau of desperation when you drink the whiskey and the whiskey doesn't even work anymore. 
You're drinking just to stop the shaking, but I'm not getting taken out of this misery. And that's where I was. When I went to get up off the floor, I remember collapsing back down to the floor. And I began to weep uncontrollably. I had no idea what was about to happen to me. Because the very same God that I mocked and spat at and hated to hear, that very same God, I made a plea to, please take me from this. I don't want to die. It was the first time that I can recall that I didn't welcome death. I was in a flea bag motel one time and ate a whole bunch of pills and washed them down with Jack Daniels and prayed to die. Because that's where alcoholism takes people like us. But this particular day, I didn't want that. I didn't welcome death. I didn't want to die. I was not thinking about Alcoholics Anonymous or going to my seven treatment center. Or doing any of the things you get to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't want to die. Please take me from this. I don't want to die. And then what happened to me was indeed miraculous. It my, was my God wink, my first touch with God. See, I thought my first encounter with God was going to be like Moses standing on a mountain. Butterflies and rainbows and this uplifting wind coming like Bill Wilson had. And it wasn't like that at all. It was awful. I collapsed to the floor, please take me from this, I don't want to die. When I was in treatment, and the few AA meetings I made, they would talk about the long-term effects of booze on the brain, audio hallucinations, seeing things, wet brain. Well, what happened to me after I make this plea to God, please take me from this, I don't want to die. I'm weeping on the floor, and as sure as, I, as I'm standing here, happened to me, and I'm not embellishing. And if you've had a God experience, you know what I'm talking about. Where God's voice cut right through all the noise. And in my left ear, it was as if someone leaned over and whispered in my ear, enough, I have other work for you to do. I had no idea what that meant until about five years into sobriety. But when it happened then, I said, oh my God, I bought the farm. This is what they were talking about. I'm hearing things. Someone just whispered in my ear. This is it. I'm completely out of my mind. Here's the good news. I was completely out of my mind. (laughs) Because in my mind, I'm not hearing God. In my mind, when I think I hear God, I'm hearing me. I'm hearing my pride. I'm hearing my ego. I become God in here. So I do ridiculous things thinking they're God-centered. And the sponsor says, that's not God, that's you. When I'm out of my mind, which is the goal in recovery, to get completely out of our mind, because that's where the main problem lies, to lose the mind completely. In fact, from here to the parking lot, leave your mind in the chair on your way home. Everyone will love you much more. <laughs> How many folks drove over here alone tonight? Anyone drive alone in their car tonight? A whole bunch. If you think about it, you really didn't drive over here alone in your car tonight. Because on the way over here, there were about 45 people you were talking to at the same time. And had a- This particular day, God separated me from me, if you will, in order to hear him. Out of my mind is where I hear God. But I didn't know what that meant. It didn't feel good. I was in horrific pain, emotional pain. My body hurt. I had no outlook on life. I'm going to die. What do I do? And God put the pieces of the puzzle together little by slowly. Please help me. Late in the day, I'm roaming through the streets, don't know what to do with my life. Who even wants to look at me? I reek on top of disappearance. I had these blood-stained soil pants. I had construction boots on, and the right boot had no front. I was wearing a turtleneck and a short jacket, and it was it was June, so it was hot, but I'm cold and sweating at the same time. I'm dying of alcoholism, and the only person I can think of to come and get me in this condition is my dad. But how could I, how could I have him come see his firstborn like this? I'm the oldest of his three brothers. I can't even fathom what it's like seeing your firstborn in this condition. I come from an Italian American family. We're Catholics, which meant me being the first male born, the expectations were mild. It was Pope or President. <laughs> and here I am homeless. I, I didn't do too good. My dad was in a place called Atlantic City, uh, New Jersey, with his uh, wife, and they were gambling and watching a show and spending some time down there. And somewhere that night, my dad told me this at my first AA birthday. He said, I had a feeling in my gut, is how he described it. 
the intuitive voice that we all get, that quite frankly we're born with. Our book talks about developing this, this thing because it's always there. That I was in trouble and he trekked from Atlantic City all the way to New York, which is about, about a four hour drive, driving through the streets to look for me. And I was trying to reach him that day. And he drove up to a street corner. I was across the street from him, and he got out of his car, and he called my name. And the very first thing I said to him is, I'm okay. I'm all right. And then when he walked up to me, I collapsed. It was the end. I collapsed in his arms, and what my dad was saying, he's a civilian. He's not a God guy. He kept repeating over and over and over again, I'm not going to lose my son to this. I'm not going to lose my son to this. Almost like a mantra. And I was very much aware at that moment of my old man holding me up because he and I just didn't get along basically my entire life. We were just two ships passing in the night. I was into hippies and music when I was growing up and baseball, and my dad really thought that was kind of like needed to be medicated for this problem I was having. He wasn't into music. He wasn't into hippies. He wasn't into sports. He knew how to use a baseball bat for other things because he makes Tony Soprano look like Tinkerbell, if you get my idea. But in this horrific moment, our roots grasped new soil. I had no idea where I was going to land. I knew something was happening. We were uprooted out of where we were. I think my dad challenged his old belief systems about being a dad and a man, and I did as a young man and as a son, and my life, where was it going? And I was placed in my seventh treatment center. And things have never been the same. I was not a poster child for treatment in treatment number seven either because after 10 days of being in treatment, I was thirsty again. I wanted to get a drink. So that's what my alcoholism does. Now, how bad yesterday was tomorrow or today, it'll pretty up the junkyard to trick me to go pick up a drink again. The thing is I'm alcoholic and I don't have power, choice, or control over it anyway. I can try to think the drink true, play the tape to the end, but my alcoholism will get me and I'll go pick up a drink. And I'm an alcoholic. Once I have one, I have to have the second. And then I have to have the third. And then I have to have another one. And I'm on another run again. Wondering, how did I get here? When I was in the back of that hallway in June of 88, I remember thinking, how did I wind up here? I come from a decent family. I will never say dysfunctional from the podium. I was the one who was dysfunctional in my family, and they're not here to defend themselves. But it was a decent family, upper middle class. We were given good values. One of my brothers became a successful businessman. My other brother's in California. He's an actor. What happened to this? To this? How did I wind up here with six treatment centers under my belt, about to go into number seven? I have a jail record. I mean, where did, how did this happen? Alcoholism was not done, by the way, and it's not done now, 30 years later. Because my illness is cunning, baffling, and powerful, and it's incredibly patient. And my job is to suit up and show up and get spiritually fit. Work out in the AA gym with the sponsor. To tell you in a general way what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. I picked up a drink. uh, I'm from a place called Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm 14 years old, and back in the day, it was the 70s, everyone hung out on street corners, And you had a a group of guys, a crew we called them, that you belonged to. And there's one for all, an awful one. And I liked hanging out with the older guys who were worldly. They were like 16 and 17 years old. And they were teaching me the facts of life. And there I was. But I was reluctant one night to drink with them. They were drinking cold 45 beer. They were hanging out on the corner drinking beer. And they were roughhousing and talking to the girls, and I wanted what they had to offer. Just I was just too afraid to do it. Fear-based and insecure, my alcoholism was present before I picked up a drink. That selfish, self-centered, fear-based, insecure guy. I was a very talented uh, musician growing up, and no matter how much applause I would get, it was not enough. I was a bright kid in school, no matter how many A's I would pull, not enough. Because I had that thing in here. That no matter what I did, it just wasn't right. My mind owned me, and I didn't know it then. I knew nothing about this stuff. For some reason, I put my hand in there, and I grabbed a quart of cold 45 beer and took a couple of pops, and uh, nothing happened. And I drank a little bit more, and nothing happened. And I drank a little bit more, and something started to happen. I drank a little bit more, and then it happened. 
And I start to feel, Bill says in his story, I had arrived, I had arrived. I start to feel okay. I start to feel okay in my skin. It was a panacea for my ills. I finally struck gold. I felt okay. I got taller, better looking, rough house with the guys. I was able to talk to the girls. I was Al Pacino around midnight. I loved the, the effect produced by alcohol. This was a great thing. The pain, the awful pain of my mom committing suicide and dying was removed. I was terribly afraid of my dad, and I wasn't thinking about him. I was present to the moment. I was drinking cold 45 beer. Everything was okay. Everything was okay. Plans and designs about what I'm going to do. But for the first time, I felt power. I felt in control. I felt I was back in the saddle. Everything's okay. Give me more. I knew nothing about a phenomenon called craving. Who knew about mental obsession? And what is a spiritual malady? Never heard of these words. I knew I drank, I want more. And don't pull the plug on this. Because later that night when the guys were going home, I went into panic mode. You can't go home. You cannot end this. It's the first time I've arrived. First time I feel connected and okay. And the following Saturday, I made sure I got drunk. And the following Saturday, I made sure I got drunk. I had no idea. I stepped onto a road paved right to hell called alcoholism. I'm an alcoholic synonymous. Not to be programmed by the program of alcoholic synonymous, but to get transformed by the program of alcoholic synonymous. I'm here to practice fidelity to my God and not cheat on my God by putting money ahead of God. A prestige ahead of my God, or anything like that. Because I need this with the desperation of a drowning man. Trust me, guys, a lot of people could do this talk tonight. I need you a lot more than you need me. I need my AA. I need my God. I need my steps, because I know what happens to me when I don't have that. That's why I keep suiting up and showing up for fun and for free. This is the last house on the block. My drinking assumes more serious proportions, and what happens, you start to experience consequences. Because I start to steal from my family. I start to stop showing up for events I was supposed to be at. And one day I discovered my dad's checkbook and had this great idea, this brainstorm, that if I can forge his check, his name on one of those checks, I can go down to the local store and they will cash it. That's just what they did. A lot of the merchants knew my dad, and quite frankly, a lot of them were afraid of my dad. So it's anything for your pop, and they cashed the check for 20 bucks. I did it again. I thought I hit like lottery. This was a great thing. See, I thought those checks, when they cashed them, they just went into like cyberspace somewhere. They vanished. I didn't know anything about something called a checking statement. They all came back. And back in the day, they got the whole check with the rubber stamp on the back, and there were a bunch of them. And my dad got a hold of them. And I called home one day, and my brother said, Dad's looking for What did you do now? And my dad was looking for me. Now, this is not the type of guy you want looking for you, even when he's feeling happy, joyous, and free. And one day I'm hanging out on the Lower East Side. I was sitting in the car with this young lady. Now, this was a scene because I fell in love with her the night before. I'm sitting in the car, and back in New York we had a way to drive. You push the seat all the way back, the windows go down, the music goes really loud, and you lean way over, and you got a Walmart pinky ring on, going, you know. And I was like Snoop Dogg and Dirty Harry rolled into one. I had my shirt open down to here. I don't know why. <laughs> and my dad drives up in like a big Lincoln Continental, and he sees me. He gets out of the car and screams my name. He's looking for vengeance because I stole from him. And I handle it like any player would, any man's man would do, anything any tough guy would do. And it went like this. Honey, that's my dad. You talk to him. I got to run away. And I started to take off. And my dad caught me. And uh, I went, that's how I got to my first treatment center. And when he caught me, I blamed her in the cause. First thing I did is her fault. The guys in the neighborhood. And then I began to cry because mom committed suicide and I'm all screwed up. And my dad says, I understand that, but you're going to something called a treatment center. And I went for 28 days into treatment. Now, this was interesting being in treatment because I didn't even think I was an alcoholic. I hadn't conceived to my innermost self. I didn't really know what alcoholism was. I got caught stealing from my dad. I drink a lot, so he's put me in this, this camp for 28 days. And I did push-ups and sit-ups. I talked a lot about my feelings. In treatment, they want to know about your feelings. How are you feeling today? I got three days detoxing. How do you think I'm feeling today? 
They talked about my dysfunctional family, my triggers, my enablers, and all this other stuff. And after 28 days, I needed a double vodka more than on the way in. But as soon as I got out, I picked up a drink. I've been through seven treatment centers. And in my first six treatment centers, I managed, as the truth, managed over a number of years, two days of continuous sobriety. That was after my fifth treatment center. That's what I come up with on my own power. Chapter 10, Gnostic says, lack of power is my dilemma. That sums it up for me. I don't have power to do anything. I need a committee meeting just to tie my shoelaces in the morning. I do not have the power. I'm broken. I'm flawed. That's my condition. Scripture says I'm weak flesh, sold unto the slavery of sin. The things I don't want to do, I do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. That's my condition. And I can't change it by my own power. I can't work it out with my own power. I can do 200 meetings in 90 days. I still got the same cat that walked in here. What I need is power to have no dilemma. And God, little by slowly, kept giving me a taste of my own alcoholism. To the point where he brought me literally, well, figuratively, to the edge of a cliff to get my attention. And when God gets our attention, our book says, we're beat into a state of reasonableness. When someone's not reasonable, you can't negotiate with them. Like my ex-wife, for example. Anyway. <clears throat> when someone is reasonable, you can talk. You can negotiate. I had to be beaten to a place where God spoke, and I listened. But the first few years, I was listening to no one because I didn't think I had a problem. And what's worse, when I believed I had a problem going into my fifth treatment center, I still wanted to run the show. I wanted to tweak this program. I wanted to tweak how many meetings I should make. I wanted to tweak the thing called sponsorship and still run the show. But if I always do what I always did, I'm always going to get what I always got. Nothing's changed. In fact, for someone like me, getting a little bit of information can be dangerous. Because I can talk to talk. I can carry on the AA, com- you know the conversations we have? We have like our own language. I can do that while I was in and out of treatment, but I couldn't stay sober. And I quickly made my second and third and fourth treatment center, and I got a job as a, a dock worker. They called it a longshoreman. It was a very powerful union back in the day, probably one of the most powerful unions in the country. I struck gold with this job making lots of money and spending it just as fast. It was a job you can never get fired from. With all the things I was doing, you can never get fired from this job. There would be a wildcat strike from east coast to west coast of the country if one of the brothers in arms got fired. You cannot get fired from this job. I got fired from that job (laughs) because of what I was doing. I became an embarrassment to my dad. I became an embarrassment to everyone. I would not show up for work other than payday and show up drunk and then leave. And so I got into my fifth treatment center. And by now I'm addicted to some narcotics along with the drinking. So I got two, two, two devils screaming at me to use. I got one, one with the booze and one with the narcotics. I don't know which one to answer, but I'm sick all the time. I'm hurting all the time. I can't function. I had no relationships. I dated people. I had family. I had so-called friends. But I look at it now because you live life forward and understand it backwards. I had no relationships. And I say this because the thing I had to serve was my alcoholism first. And anything else was just in the way or a means to an end. It wasn't until I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and had some spiritual muscles that I began finally to have relationships with men, relationships with women, and look at people different. Boy, do I need Alcoholics Anonymous. I got into my fifth treatment center, truly by a wing and a prayer. And what they did for me, it was a 28-day model back then. 28 days and they'd ship you out. And the people in this treatment center said, 28 days is not enough, we need to keep you longer. And they held me in this treatment center for nine weeks, which back in the day was pretty much unheard of, nine weeks being in an inpatient treatment center. But that's what they did for me. Because you can't, you can't leave, you're going to get drunk and you're going to die. So they hold on to me for nine weeks. And after nine weeks of being in treatment, I'm looking relatively healthy. And the color back in my face. They put on some weight. I'm eating three squares a day. I'm bathing regularly. I'm going to these groups. I'm going to the gym. 
I'm working out in a gym. So after nine weeks, I look pretty good, look pretty healthy. I don't look like the drunk who walked in the door nine weeks prior. Hmm? In fact, close to discharge, when they told me we're going to have to discharge you on a Saturday, I said, I think I'm pretty good. I think I'm good to go. I think I know what I need to do. My, uh, my, my mantra to the next drunk. I'll go to those meetings, but I think I'm good. And they discharged me on a Saturday. And immediately I was met with my alcoholism. Immediately I was met with the chatter in the head. All the voices, all the characters, all the stage characters. I was met with anxiety, sweating, uncomfortability. I couldn't eat. I couldn't talk. I couldn't sleep. I tossed and turned for two days. And my mind says, one drink, one little bump, just something to take the edge off, and you'll go to AA and you'll be fine. Just a little drinky poo, just a taste, just something. You need something, Pete. Just one time, don't worry about this illness talking to me, how it lies. On Monday morning, I went from a place called Staten Island, New York, all the way to downtown Brooklyn. That's a hell of a ride. And I went to my liquor store, where I'd always buy my whiskey. He wasn't even open yet, and I'm pacing back and forth. Now, what I want to share with you, after nine weeks of being in my fifth treatment center, how I experienced alcoholism. My body did not need a drink after nine weeks of being in treatment. It did not need a drink. I had no post-acute withdrawal syndrome going on. I had no body ailments going on. I was physically fit. In fact, I was as sober as I'll ever be for the rest of my life. I didn't have a drink or a drug in me for nine weeks. My body was fine. My body did not need a drink. But the mind was another story. The mind says, yeah, we need a drink. We need a drink to the point where I'm outside the liquor store and my hands are shaking, my belly's upset, and I got the cold sweats going on. I really need a drink and my body's starting to hurt. I really need a drink. And the liquor store owner put the key in the door, opened it up. I put my money underneath the glass partition. I got a pint of Mr. Boston Blackberry Brandy and drank it down as fast as I could. You know what happened when I was done with it? The shaking stopped. The voices got quiet. I was breathing okay. I felt powerful. I was back in the saddle. I'm in control. I feel good because that's what it's supposed to do. It's a sedative. The problem is I'm alcoholic, guys. So I had to go back in and get another pint. And by the time I finish the second pint, I'm drunk. And what I like to do when I get drunk is get drunker. (laughs) And I like to eat pills. So now I got the third pint. I'm in the projects copping pills. And as that big book says, thus started one more journey to the asylum for Jim, thus started one more journey to hell for me. And I didn't see that one coming when I was sitting in treatment dry. It won't announce its arrival. I can't see suddenly come and say, hey, my illness is down the block. I need to call the sponsor. It's too late. It owns me. And the thing about alcoholism, because I experienced this in early recovery, alcoholism will go underground based on my experience and some others and resurface in other areas. While I'm sober, going to meetings with no spiritual fitness, my alcoholism shows up in a sex spree, a food spree, a money spree, a fear spree, a gambling spree, something. Because I can't be present watching TV, sitting on the couch when everything's okay. Can't do it. It's too uncomfortable. I'm so accustomed to noise in my head that when recovery gives me some moments of bliss, some moments of stillness, I need to create activity because it feels like something's wrong with me. That's why meditation was so difficult for me at the beginning. It's too quiet. I mean, we could, I could be sitting on a couch. All the bills are paid. The house is beautiful. Good neighborhood, new car, car's good. Money's good, health is good, kids are good, wife's good, house good, job good, everything's good. I go, this is pretty good. Then my mind says, yeah, but remember this. And then I'm right back in again. What do I do with this thing? I think it's an understatement when my big book tells me that the main problem for me centers in the mind, not the body, because my default button is go right to the mind. And pain becomes the norm. Walk around in pain. Constantly, how you doing, Joe? I'm hanging in there, you know, it's tough. Why? Why am I not free in the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous? Why am I not free in the sacred fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous? Why am I walking around sober, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and not experience the glory of God and feeling some bliss and some freedom, some hope for the future? Big book says the best years of a life are ahead of us, and I'm going, I'm hanging in there, hanging in How long are you sober? 45 years, I'm hanging in there. 
A youngin comes in, they're hanging in there. That's difficult, counting days and months. But I have a responsibility. See, I didn't get me sober. I speak for myself. I didn't just quit drink. I didn't put the plug in a jug. That's someone else's story. I couldn't do that. I could not stop drinking. God separated me from alcohol on June 23rd, 1980. There was a condition. I work for him now. And part of working for him is taking care of his kids. As Sam Shoemaker says, stand by the door and wait. Whether it's a guy with 30 years, a woman with 20 years, that we direct to the woman and men to the men, but a young and coming in with 10 days and has no clue what to do. That's my responsibility. That's why God says, I'm going to get you sober. Go to work for me. Go take care of my kids. Your primary purpose. I'll take care of the other stuff. In fact, my experience has been that my job is not even to take care of myself. You know, I like to run to keep in shape. I like to try to eat right to take care of myself. It's the default button. My job is not to take care of myself. That's God's job. God's job is to care for my life and care for me. And when he's done, he will send me home. My job is to serve God, period. And I do that by being a servant to Alcoholics Anonymous. And somehow when I'm serving God and serving Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm employed. I'm saving money. I go to doctors, take care of my body. God says, go to the doctor, go work on that newcomer, get to that meeting, answer the call, go do this. You see, every day, I don't have to worry about balance anymore. I can't tell how many newcomers come to me as I'm having a problem with balance. That's the problem. You're trying to figure out balance. Just turn it over to God. God, where do you want me next? Go to home group. Okay, done. Grab the newcomer at the door. Okay, now my night's occupied. I got something else to do. Get a job, go to work five days a week. Okay, the day's taken care of. Most good ideas are simple. When I get involved, they become trigonometry. (laughs) And I get to not regain a relationship with God. How can I look for something when it was never lost? But to experience a oneness with God, a connection with God. Fifth step promises to talk about walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. I suffered enough pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization, the P-A-I-N, the pain coming in here. I want something else. And something happens when I'm serving God and serving AA. Things seem to work. Not perfect. God knows I make a ton of mistakes. But there's a purpose to a life. There's a direction to a life. We can see the road ahead of us. It wasn't like that for so many years. In fact, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, members of AA, including my sponsor, told me, walk this road, which I never walked before. Do 12 steps, which I knew nothing about. And you're going to experience this power called God, which I knew even less about. And the only thing that allowed me to put one foot in front of the other and chop wood and carry water was the fire that burned in my soul to get right with something like we all have. We all look for it in the bottom of a whiskey bottle, that electric that would catch me and I'll be okay finally. And it worked for a little while. It's followed by a hangover. And it doesn't work anymore. Or it's followed by waking up to someone, when did I meet them? Guys, you remember drinking, she looked like Bo Derek? And the next morning she looked like Bo Diddley? And here when you got to... to, (laughs) I get to do this. To have a purpose-driven life in those words, enough I have other work for you to do. About five years into sobriety, I start to taste what God meant by that. I start to have my own personal God experiences. See, the big book talks about the spiritual awakening, sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. But we have these experiences, these God winks along the path, whatever it might be. But God will speak to you and speak to me and speak to others in a way that we can understand. And the thing that we get in our language, in our way, something clicks. And June 23rd, 1988, was the, when the pilot light got turned on, was the catalyst for the whole thing. I didn't know it then. How many times when something felt so painful, I thought it was bad. It was actually pain trying to awaken me, trying to, trying to flip me. God's pursuing every one of us, huh? Begging to have a relationship with every one of us. And every time God shows up and looks to feed my soul, I look this way until I run out of road. 
We're called to sanctity, whether we like it or not. And I don't have to be in a monastery to live that life, to live a monastic life. I can do it here by going to work and raising children and coming to meetings. It's the, 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 what's in the soul. The soul food has been, the, the, the soul has been awakened. My first treatment center, I knew nothing about this. I got out of my uh, seven treatment center after 10 days of being in there. They shipped me to a place uh, in Minnesota. I knew nothing about the Midwest. I knew nothing about Minnesota. All I knew was cold. And why are you shipping me out here for more treatment? I thought I was done after my seven treatment center. I spent a day and a half in my six treatment center and walked out the door. I couldn't do this. I could not detox. I really need a drink, and I'm not doing this. Somewhere in there, my dad got me this little apartment. I got thrown out of this apartment. I had the Bowery living in this, this apartment. It was a pigsty. I couldn't do life. And on my way into my seven treatment center, I really thought as much as I wanted to get sober, who am I kidding? I'm a great star or a terrible finisher. I never finished anything in my life. I want instant gratification. I want it to last. But I don't want to work for it. And they shipped me out to Minnesota for six more weeks of treatment. And then I went to something called a halfway house and something called a three-quarter house and something called a sober house. And I'm getting a week into a month into another month. And while I was out there, they took me to a meeting in Minneapolis called a Three Legacies meeting. And Three Legacies meeting was a little bit bigger than this on a Friday night. And the speakers got up to the podium dressed. And I had two 10-minute speakers and a keynote speaker that told their story. And I was pinned up against the back of the wall because I felt so uncomfortable and so unworthy of being a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I would be pinned up against the back because I didn't feel worthy to get in the first few rows. I knew you were going to look at me and say, what is he doing here? But there I was, and I heard a message that I never heard before. Now, I'm sure God was sending messages out, but I heard it. See, God didn't just find me in Alcoholics Anonymous. God found me in the back of an abandoned building. And when I was in the back of an abandoned building, I had just as much God in me then as I do now, like the crackhead or the dauphine or the drunk under a bridge tonight who's getting drunk and high and ruining their life. They have just as much God in them tonight as we do here tonight as well. It was just missing a connection. And here I was in the back of the room. And one night a speaker got up there. And you know when they tell us in AA, eventually you'll hear your story? Well, the speaker that night looked like Sigmund Freud. I said, I'm not going to hear my story tonight. He had even wore a bow tie. He says, this is, I'm, this is going to be a long night. And he got up to the podium and shared his experience, strength, and hope. And that man who I never saw again, who was much older than me, come from a well-to-do family in Minnesota. He was a professional he was a medical man, told my story. He spoke to my soul that night. And that was the first time he says, maybe I can be a member here because that guy's like me. And I looked around the room with these well-dressed people. I said, maybe I can be like that one day. Maybe I could be a member of good standing. Maybe I could be a good citizen and not be a bum that I've been most of my life. I was brought home to New York after about a year, and I met my first sponsor, my first appointed teacher, and he talked about the message in this big book. And that man took me through the steps and showed me how to be a member of good standing, took me through traditions, and taught me about the importance of sponsorship in the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And after about 10 years, I needed another sponsor because sponsors get sick. We all have clay feet. And he wasn't doing well spiritually. And I loved him, and I talked to him about it, but he was beyond being teachable. And a gentleman from Texas showed up, Mark Houston. And Mark H. became my sponsor for a long time. Mark passed away, and my current sponsor is Mickey from Denver, Colorado, who has been a godsend. Because he talked to me about the, more, the greater importance of having a God in my life. 
I'll share a quick story with you, what Mickey did for me as a sponsor going through the 12 steps. Again, sometimes we can't see God coming. We can't see the conversion about to happen, but I'm just chopping wood and carrying water, plowing the field, and God will do the growing. See, something happens to us when we go through the 12 steps. We have this spiritual transformation over and over and over again. But the catalyst, when it really began for me, was the back of an abandoned building. But here I am going through the steps with Mickey. And I'm writing my fourth step. And I'm writing about my anger towards the Catholic Church as an institution. About some of the things I read in the headlines. I'm a Catholic. And in the fifth step, I'm reading this to my sponsor. Resentment, cause, resentment, cause, and so on. And he says to me, hold on a second. How long have you been nursing that grudge? And right away, I gave him some justification he said, I thought resentments were the number one offender. When did you get bigger than alcoholism? When did you transcend alcoholism? When did these rules not apply to you? And he read me the riot act. He said, let me ask you a question, Peter. He said, you go to AA? I says, yeah. <laughs> Is every AA meeting a healthy meeting? I said, no. Have people celebrated anniversaries drunk? I said, yeah. Are there 13 steppers in AA? I said, yeah. He said, but you keep going back, don't you? He said, yeah. And you practice love and tolerance? I said, yeah. And you try to bring a solution, be a good member there. I says, yeah. He says, how come you can't do that with your church? I had no answer. But I knew I was gossiping. He says, you need to go back and you need to make amends for the gossip and slandering the character assassination. Here was my any lens. So that's what I did. We have something called confession. I went into the little confession booth. I told the, the, the priest, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I told him what I'd been doing, how he'd been feeling. And unbeknownst to me, he says, I understand. And he began to talk to me, which is usually unlike when you go into one of these things. I says, look, I'm a member of AA, and part of this is trying to make it right. What can I do to make it right? And he said to me this. He says, can you come to service? Can you come to Mass tomorrow morning? He's okay. And that's what I did. I've been going since. And I'll serve for my church. And it's one of the greatest things that ever happened to me along with Alcoholics Anonymous. I couldn't see that one coming. But who would, who would have saw that on the way into the 12 steps? Who would have saw that when I began writing inventory? That the ground was fertile enough to do an inventory. And all the work in inventory, there was one piece of inventory that unlocked the gates of hell for me. Didn't see that one coming. That's God's way of remaining anonymous and keeep me right-sized and keeping me teachable. And I'm reading inventory, reading inventory, come to institutions, and bang, my whole life changes. How dark it is before the dawn. And what a hypocrite I was walking around here, praising God, talking about God, and never going to his house. I'm not saying you have to do. That's what I had to do. That's my walk. And over and over and over again in this journey, God has given me these little God winks. Found a home group in Brooklyn, New York. Found a sponsor. When my sponsor went sideways, God gave me another sponsor. God gave me employment. Just God kept taking care of me. Life is problematic, it's unfair, as I said earlier. God kept steering me through with some hiccups here and there. The thing I learned about this God, when I think I'm powerful, when I think I'm strong, is when I'm weakest. And when I'm at my weakest is when I experience my God. When I'm most vulnerable, it's when I experience God. When I'm turning to God, it's when I experience God. And what I've, I've learned is that the times when it seems tumultuous, that now is an undercurrent. There's an undercurrent of okayness, of stillness that I don't know how and I don't know when, but I'm going to get through this. That's the God stuff we get in Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you're around here long enough, you've had it. The loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, the breakup of a relationship, the health scare, whatever it might be, money short. How am I going to get through this? I just know I am. And not once is the mindset, let's go get loaded and figure it out. Indeed, the miraculous. A friend of mine describes alcoholism in a very unique way. He says, if you go, go into a meeting of AA and you see all the AA members there, imagine them, their cars in a parking lot. And alcoholism has the key to every car. And any car it wants, it has the key, gets in, puts the key, and drives away, and no one can stop it. That's me. Unless I have God. Hampton Lee, years ago, I was working with prayer and meditation. 
I always wondered for years whatever happened to my mom after she died, yes? I mean, we talk about heaven, but what is that? You know, what, what, where, did, where, did, where did she go? I love and adore this woman. Whatever happened to her? But early on in recovery, I was going to church, and I would light two candles for the sick and suffering in and out of the rooms and light a candle for my mom. And nine years into recovery, I'm working with prayer and meditation, and uh, something happens to me that changed my life. I'm sitting on in meditation. Next thing you know, I'm sitting on the beach in this meditation, and my God walks towards me, and out of his chest appears my mom. My mom kneels down and gives me a hug. My higher power puts his arm around me and tells me she's okay, she's with me. My mom points off to the horizon to the left and the horizon to the right, and each time she's pointing at these hundreds upon hundreds of flickering lights. I've been going to Mass for nine years, lighting two candles one uh, each week, two candles faithfully each week. I came out of meditation, and I called my sponsor. I said, I just had this experience. I says, uh, and my mom pointed to these lights. I don't know what these lights are all about without missing a beat. He says, Peter, you've been going to church and lighting candles for your mom. I says, yeah. He says, she let you know she got them. And on, in that moment, I realized that I'm known by my creator. A tremendous amount of freedom, knowing that we're known by a creator, that the God we worship, the God we serve, he is the heart. He is the soul. The same way when you walk into a meeting of alcoholics and you sit down, not doing okay, and the drunk sitting next to you says, what's wrong? Something's up. How we can read each other's souls. The great thing, we speak each other's language. I'll just close with this. A couple of weeks ago, we were in Akron, Ohio, and we got to visit um, Touch, our history. Going to the Siebeling Estate, Dr. Bob's house, where he would detox people in one of the rooms, where we did third step prayer in one of the rooms. Going to the hospital where uh, Sister Ignatia worked. And then we went to uh, the Siebeling Estate to the guest house, where Bill was supposed to meet Bob. Bob said 15 minutes, and we all know what happened. It was a five-hour meeting, and we got to walk into this room and sit in the room where the course of history for people like us was changed forever. That one drunk said, I'm giving this bird 15 minutes. And five hours later, they met. They spoke each other's language. And we're here tonight. I got to stand in that room. Because Bill knew he needed to work with the drunk. Need to work with a drunk. I need to work with a drunk. I don't need a drink. I need a drunk is what Bill said. Need to work with a drunk. We survived a certain trials and low spots ahead by doing that. Incredible, incredible story. There's a story in um, the soul of sponsorship. And this, to me, sums up what we're about. It was in November. Bill's at the 24th Street Clubhouse. He's flat broke. He's the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous and flat broke. He's living upstairs in the clubhouse. No job. Lois is, will, Lois is working. He's hanging his clothes on nails, uh, put in a wall. He has no outlook uh, for anything. People in AA think he's drunk. He's experiencing his depression, doesn't know what to do. And the, the, the person comes up and says, there's someone downstairs to see you. And Bill says, not another drunk. I don't want to hear it from another drunk. I don't want to work with it. I'm done. And Bill says, send them up. And he hears his drunk walking up the steps, but it wasn't a drunk. It was Father Ed Dowling. And he sits down with Bill. And as Bill describes it, he was taken in by his presence and pretty much did a fifth step with him, a confession. And from that moment forward, Bill was changed. What if Bill didn't take the call? What if I don't pick up the phone? What if I don't talk to the newcomer? What would have happened to me if they didn't speak to me? What if I had contempt prior investigation? What if you had contempt prior investigation with me when I showed up? So I chop wood and carry water and pray to be teachable in this sacred fellowship and give this message away with the same love and gratitude that you give it to me every time I walk into the meeting called Alcoholics Anonymous. That's all I got, guys. Peace.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.